Good morning and welcome to Hickory Plains Church of the Nazarene, February 19th, 2023. And I'm super excited about the words from uh, the Bible, God's Word, that I'm going to be sharing with you. And so before I get started and the Spirit may move, will move, I want to ask you, if you listen to our sermons often, please subscribe to our channel and give us a thumbs up. We would really appreciate that. But today, we're going to talk about Ash Wednesday, and the title of my sermon is Jesus, the Bread of Heaven. And uh, our call to worship, if you are not with us in person, is Lord, I Need You. We love to start with prayer and just a, a song that sets the the atmosphere and that song will be lord i need you um ash wednesday marks the beginning of the christian easter season and it begins a uh, 40 days of lent ash wednesday should be a day of repentance and reflection that leads each of us to earnestly and critically consider our own mortality and dependence on God. With this in mind, we enter a season of fasting. Gabriel Benjamin from Water for the Way, a book and devotional series that we are all engaging in, has this to say about the act of sacrifice called fasting. The essence of fasting is to joyfully give ourselves to others for their hunger pains to be quenched. We are invited to fast and perhaps even share from our resources while we fast so that others may feel warmth and wellness without guilt or shame. We do not fast to show our wealth. We fast to share our wealth. The generous giving of oneself is the kind of practice that reflects the image of God, of the God of Scripture, who made the ultimate sacrifice for us so that we may be redeemed and restored. <clears throat> but Lent is also a time for confronting our own sin. Psalms 139, 23-34 is some of my favorite scripture. In my darkest hours, I have cried this out to the Lord. Search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. What a beautiful prayer. Sin is sometimes treated as a taboo, taboo subject, something people don't want to be confronted with or talk about. Yet, most of us riddle, readily admit greed, violence, and poverty are just a few examples of sin and the residual crises that exist in our world. Even if we don't like to talk about our own transgressions, we can be quick to point it out in the lives of others. The challenge for us is to be re is to recognize and admit that sin is something we also fall prey to and participate in. Lent is the season to f confront our sin, so we might move into a deeper relationship with God. In my series on John the Gospel, we have come to chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on water, and then as hordes of people begin following Jesus as if he's a rock star, he admonishes them concerning earthly comfort and gain and calls them to put all that aside and believe. I'm going to begin connecting some dots between Jesus as man and the fulfillment of prophecy demonstrated in the sacred meals and set times or feasts that were part of the law. In today's Bible lesson, I'm going to focus on Jesus' own reference to himself as bread of life. Verse uh, verses 32 through 36 of chapter 6 says, <clears throat> excuse me, I really got a froggy throat this morning. Uh, verse 32 through 36 of chapter 6 says, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. They grumbled about Jesus, the son of Joseph, saying, He came down from heaven. Then, in verse 48 through 51, Jesus explains, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they die. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give 
for the life of the world. Among humans, friendships is often expressed in having a meal together. A beautiful part of our created world is the flavor, smell, and ambience brought by mealtime. Some of my greatest memories through all the chapters of my life are our family table times or holidays that brought friends and family together for a day to eat and bask in each other's presence. They are also a part of covenant making. Today's traditions at wedding receptions are pieces of Old Testament promise making ceremonies. The ancient Israelite feasts were a means of celebrating special relationship with Yahweh. The first feast, or actually set-apart time, was an annual commemoration instructed by the Lord of the Hebrew children's successful departing from Egypt. It is called Passover. A component of these functions was sacrifice. For every purpose, the sealing of a vow, praise for an, un- for an answered prayer, the seasonal harvest, or simply to enjoy the presence of God, a sacrifice was made, and it would serve different people. Sometimes the priests and their families. Other times it was more of a family barbecue with the Lord as a special guest. No matter the occasion, the sacrifice was viewed as sanctifying those who participated in the meal. However, sacrifices and meals alone did not guarantee fellowship with God. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 says, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Jesus entered a time and space in history perfectly orchestrated by our sovereign God, where worship and sacrifice had once again taken a place of grandeur among men who held themselves in very high esteem, but looked down with scorn on a hurting, suffering world. They expected God to be honored to have them in His presence. Little did they know God had brought to earth the answer to the prayers and yearnings they were too callous to understand and confess. They wanted freedom and power. It came, and they didn't recognize it. Back to my scripture context, Jesus was crossing the countryside healing and feeding. He was attracting quite a crowd everywhere he went. Considering the current social conditions, the masses were thrilled someone had come to give them a hand up and ease their pain. Jesus begins to direct the focus away from the immediate physical needs of the world to the spiritual predicament, and he used the concepts known well to those he was among. One of the most important occasions for sacred meals was Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In the inaugural Passover meal, the blood of the lamb was painted over doorposts, covering the threshold and protecting occupants who had obeyed from the plague of the firstborn. The first annual celebration was modified and the blood of the lamb or goat was no longer smeared on doorposts. Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread together now formed an eight-day festival, seven plus one. The birth of Israel is remembered with all the males appearing as representatives of their families. Where the blood was a covering from judgment and God's wrath, it was now a means of fellowship, a meal before and with Yahweh. Immediately following the observance came the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The rationale for this feast was that on the first day of the Exodus, Yahweh brought Israel's armies out of Egypt, and they left in haste, eating the bread of affliction, the unleavened bread left over from the Passover night. However, this sacred meal had a theological purpose, the backward historical glance that would result in thankfulness to God. This feast was how Jesus chose to transform a new institution to mark his coming substitutionary death for the nation. In this new age, Jesus' blood would serve the same purpose as the Passover lamb. But instead of handing down meat of the lamb to his disciples, Jesus foregoes the logical connection to blood and astutely presents himself as unleavened bread, God's manna from heaven. The death of the Passover lamb was about to become redundant. The sacrifice has been made, and there is no other substitute. It cannot be repeated. A new covenant was in the making. Jesus sought to draw and focus attention away from physical needs, and especially death, to the need for spiritual nourishment. No longer would eating a meal at a specified time of year maintain fellowship with God. It was now superseded by the partaking in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. 
If you were with us in person, we would now be passing and serving the elements of communion, the unleavened bread, and the wine or grape juice in our case. If you have these elements at home, pause the video and collect them and you can join us. But first, we're going to ask a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless these elements that we bring to you and help us to recognize that um, they are not living parts of you, but representative of a living you in our lives and among us. We praise you for this opportunity to dwell with you in such an intimate and precious way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Paul believed that the church was living post-Passover and in the days of unleavened bread. That's in 1 Corinthians 5, 8. It says, Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Unleavened bread was part of the picnic meal prepared in advance of the Hebrews' deliverance. Symbolically, it represents holiness, sinlessness, Yeast allows bread to mold and be unpalatable, toxic for our body systems. Therefore, we hold this small, small token and acknowledge Jesus is perfectly enough physically and spiritually. Like the ancient Jewish people, Jesus shared time and space with, we are called to look back historically and remember Christ's body was given as a sacrifice, an offering. It had value and was an exchange, his death for our breath, his pain for our peace. The wine representative of Christ's blood shed is also a symbol of great rejoicing, and it was compulsory, compulsory to drink four cups, all with the purpose of explaining the oppression, rescue from, or the exodus, and God's all-sufficient provision yesterday, today, and for all eternity. The fellowship with God conveyed by the old sacrificial system is irrelevant at the table of the Lord's Supper. This calls us as believers to a closer fellowship with God in this world, but also make us deeply aware that there will be occasion of great rejoicing when we will take our place with many across the ages and feast in the presence of the Lord forever. He is all we will ever need, and it has been such a blessing to walk this journey, and it is an honor to share it with you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for your holiness. We are human, and without you, we cannot exist or sustain ourselves by any means. Thank you for providing a way to live in relationship with you and the hope of our eternity in your love and glory. Amen. And now, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine up on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You are loved. Have a blessed week.